Hello, and welcome to this week's devlog for my voxel RPG game. This is a tiny mobile RPG game with an emphasis on exploration and discovery, although it doesn't have a proper name yet. Last week, I performed some of the basic work to get a new enemy into the game, this squid monster. Now, I'd spent a good few weeks at this point focusing on combat and gameplay, but wanted to think about something that's so intrinsic to a game about exploring a fantasy world, I'm almost surprised I hadn't got to this point yet. The world itself. The terrain looked pretty boring, it was often just quite hard to tell what was going on due to the way that the lighting worked. Given that that affected the gameplay, I wanted to have a crack at improving it. How hard can it be? I actually spent much of this week moving house. It's been pretty hectic all things considered. But the code must be coded, so I took this on as a bit of an easier challenge. Huh. Okay, so the problem with the terrain was that the lighting was really shoddy. Take this scene for example. It's very difficult to tell what each voxel is doing because they all just blend together. The colours are far too consistent and the bits of the terrain that are in shadow just look stupid. My first thought to try to fix this was to mess with the material settings. But no matter how shiny I made the world, the shadows always look consistent. My next thought was to try and break up the consistency by applying some textures to the scene. I hacked in this stolen Minecraft texture into one of the slots in the hope that it would break things up. And it didn't. Obviously, I didn't put too much effort into making the textures look correct, uh, but that's really just because it became quickly obvious to me that the textures wouldn't help to break up the monotony. The problem was fundamentally in the lighting code, so I scrapped all of my own ideas and went to the internet for help. I eventually found this article about voxel game development, as well as this video by a guy called Tantan, titled, Voxel Game Development is Hard. Can relate. Pretty soon, I found what I needed, ambient occlusion. I already knew what that was, it's a thing that can be added to give more depth to a scene. However, one thing I didn't quite realise was that in a voxel game, you can add it on a per vertex basis, as each voxel conforms to a certain pattern. Hmm, sounds interesting. Tantan had used the same article as the one I had stumbled upon, and had a great time implementing it. So I decided, let's give it a go. So for each vertice on the face, you have to check its neighbors. The article provides this bit of pseudocode, but it took me a while to realize that the corner they were talking about in this code here is actually this voxel here. Oops. For each face, you have to check in the various different directions, and from that, calculate how in shadow that vertice is. Luckily for me though, Goxel, a project I had based much of my voxelizer off of, had already worked out the directions to check. So actually calculating the shadow factor wasn't that bad. Now, I just had to apply it to the mesh. Oh, wait. Well, that wasn't anywhere near as easy as I thought it would be. Let me just take you back to the beginning. My engine uses Ogre3D for graphics, as I didn't want to have to write anything like an occlusion culling algorithm myself. Now the problem is, I need to pass some diffuse values through to Ogre's system for graphics, which is called the high level material system. Basically, that's what generates shaders for you. Now that shouldn't be too hard, as you can just specify some diffuse values when you define your vertices. So I did that and it looked no different. No matter what I changed the values to, they were never used in the final shader. So after quite a bit of head scratching, I realized the problem. Ogre does not officially support diffuse colors for its physically based shader system. You know, the one that I'm using. Testing this theory, if I was to use an unlit material, the diffuse values were applied fine, it's just there was no shadow at all because it's unlit. And from this realization, it became quite clear what I needed to do. Here is a quick rundown of how the HLMS works. You have a preprocessor which does all the work of producing the finished shader. Ogre provides some template files which really just point out where to insert those shader pieces. This is how the modular system works. As say for instance your model to render has no textures, then it can just skip some logic to include the texture code in the completed shader. It's actually pretty smart. And for my purposes, there are a few ways to alter the output shader based on this piece system. In this case, using these custom pieces. With this, you can just define some shader code and it'll end up in the completed shader. Testing this out, it worked pretty well. The task at hand was to write some pieces which implement the diffuse logic. So I defined the relevant pieces to hopefully implement the fuse and it didn't work. <coughs> For some reason I couldn't work out even though I was defining the diffuse values in my vertices and passing them to the shader, which now implemented them, nothing was working. 
I do blame Ogre for this, as I think it just went, I will diffuse as a support in the PBS system. Uh, somewhere in the bowels of its C++ code. But at this point, let me just set the scene for you. It's midday Friday, I spent the week moving house, and I now have no content for my weekly videos. Fantastic. This week was really just a train wreck, and things just kept going wrong. The thing I thought would work eventually didn't, and I was running out of options to get it fixed. So it was at this point, I decided to give up. Only joking. Voxels are simple. There are only a few potential normals and only a few potential colours. I can condense both these values down to a single byte, most likely rather than the 20 or so that currently exist at the moment. An optimization I was saving for a later date. Basically, voxels are really simple. I was packing all this data like you would pack a regular model, but voxels are simple enough that you can just avoid all this. Instead of sending each normal over as three floats, you can instead just send over an integer index to reference in a normal table defined in the shader itself. Similar for positions and text UVs, as they always conform to a grid, you can send them over as ints and convert them to float positions in the shader. And with that saving, I would then have room to store, say, some diffuse values, which fit into only a few bytes. So, that was the plan. Could I get it done by the end of the week and still make this video? Well, you're watching the video, so there, you work it out. I started with position trying to get it to work the same as how it did before, now sending ints over and converting them in the shader. Now that wasn't too bad, so I tried to do normals from the table, and uh, this one was pretty bad. It was getting pretty late now, so I worked through Friday night, which uh, probably wasn't a good idea, as I spent hours messing with a single stupid error. Normals weren't working. It was only late into the night that I realised that that was because I was packing my data into the position buffer and had already set the correct positions by the time I came to process the normals. Oops. So, let that be a lesson not to keep coding too late into the night. Pleased with what I had, I could now apply these diffuse values per vertice. So, I just had to plug in the diffuse values that I'd calculated before. I did one face at a time to simplify the problem, and then, before you knew it, after a few late nights and a really stressful week, ambient occlusion was working in the game, and my god, was it glorious. Pretty much all the visual problems I had before were gone, and the world looked so much more alive. I added this slider to visualise the difference, and it's so significant I think the game would be practically unshippable without it. But I'm super happy with it, and very pleased I stuck with it. Now, let's talk about the caveats. Firstly, I have to keep the definition for the text UVs and normals in the vertex definitions, just to make Ogre do the pipeline as expected. Everything can fit into two bytes, but I have to send some of this other garbage oh to convince God. it to keep the lighting calculations and stuff in place. As much as I'm sure there's a way around it, I uh, haven't found it yet. Secondly, I'm using this magic number approach to ensure regular objects which don't go through the voxelizer are rendered correctly. There will be a better way around this, but I... Uh, don't know what it is yet. This also means that objects like the player and enemies have no ambient occlusion. I do have a few solutions to this in mind, but that'll come later, as it will likely involve some sort of custom mesh format and a lot of engine work. Anyway, on to other things now. One other thing I did do this week was try to fix the rivers a bit. Previously they were just a bit of a sort of gaping hole in the ground. I um, did this to make the map viewer appear correct, but uh, this did need some addressing. So. Rivers are now slightly lower down with blue voxels on the base. They don't look great, but I did add the logic to get the player to be able to swim in them. Um, obviously though, it's a work in progress. And really that's it for this week. It was quite a long one for me. Uh, lots of stuff happened, especially the house move. Apologies, let me just have a drink. Quite a bit of stuff did happen. I'm still trying to get sort of set up with a new environment and everything. Uh, I hope the audio sounds roughly as good. Maybe it will but I'm not convinced. Maybe I'll have to get some, some paneling or something, although I doubt the landlord would like that, so maybe I'll just ignore that. Anyway, um, I normally end these videos by banging my head on the desk, so uh, I will do that, but I thought that this time I would let the desk come to me. So, see you in the next video. Ah. Bye.